I begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for these students. Just pray you bless this class today, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, to start with, I was um, waffling over, like, well, what's the rational canonical form? And, like, I'm an idiot. So, um, at the end of last class, because it's pretty clearly spelled out, equation 12.2 on page 475, the rational canonical form, um, what's it look like? And I think you already said this last time, Jonathan. But just to say it from up here for the sake of, uh, you know. So it looks something like C companion matrix of A1 of X, the companion matrix of A2 of X, da, 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 the companion matrix of A uh, M of X. This is what. Uh, Again, it's spelled out in equation 12.2 in dominant foot. And what is the deal with these uh, <clears throat> A1, A2, and so forth? What are these guys? What is, what's the nature of A1 of X? A2 of X, da, 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 AM of X, what, what can we say about these? They, they satisfy these divisibility conditions, right? <clears throat> and this one is what? The last, yeah, this is the minimal polynomial. Of course, we could also be talking about an endomorphism on the finite dimensional vector space. Right, and then it'd be the minimal polynomial for T, and this would be with respect to a basis, a special basis which was formed from, you know, appropriate T-cyclic bases. Um, so, I guess the larger point to make here is that the rational canonical form, and each one of these is a companion matrix in Dummett and Foote setup. All right, so these are just those matrices with one on, on the subdiagonal, the first n minus one columns and then the last column in the each companion matrix, we have minus the coefficients of everything up to the nth, or up to the leading coefficient. But the leading coefficient is chosen to be 1, right, because these are monic. So that we lose the um, ambiguity in the choice of invariant divisors, right? These are the invariant divisors of the FX module. So just to try to give some sense of uh, finality to the discussion. The Jordan form, um, we can read the elementary divisors for the FX module off. Like, it's pretty much manifest. You can read off the elementary divisors. But the rational canonical form, the invariant divisors are just staring at you. All right. And you can go from one to the other and from the other to the one because we can exchange invariant factor decomposition for the elementary divisor decomposition of a, of a module over a PID. In particular, when the ring is polynomials over a field. That's it. The other static in my notes about what Curtis did, well, whatever Curtis did, he did. I don't care. Um, <laughs> but, uh, oh man, I left my computer. There's actually, um, I think I was already covering it lightly by the time I t taught you guys linear, but there's a section of my linear notes where I actually sort of study Curtis technology for decompo like the decomposition of pol um, the decomposition of polynomials and how that informs um, construction of operators on a vector space whose sum is one. And there's like there's, there's interesting formulas that come from studying the polynomial algebra of an endomorphism and like making use of it for linear algebra. Even people who teach linear algebra would be unfamiliar with some of these results unless they've been using Curtis because there's there's some really kind of weird results that come from this. For example, I told my brother a few things we learned in Curtis when I was teaching it and he was like, no, what, really? Oh, and um, that's saying something because Bill's thought a long time about linear algebra. So like there's, there's something genuinely um, a little bit different about the way Curtis does things. So if you're digging deeper into theoretical linear algebra in your future, I would encourage you to 
read through Curtis. It's not the nicest thing to read in some sense, but it's got things in there that are not quite in other places. And of course, it should go without saying that Insel Spence and Friedberg's worth worthwhile read. Of course, Thumb and Foot, but I would add to that list um, Romans Advanced Linear Algebra, and um, of course also Rotman's Advanced Modern Algebra is really quite useful as a second read in this stuff. All right, so that said. Next thing up here, I just wanted to share with you guys some, some sort of, uh, what's the word, terminology and results involving algebra itself. And so let me start out here with a definition. So this is from chapter 16 in Dumb and Foot in his section on Artinian rings. All right. So for any commutative ring, the Kroll dimension dimension, or simply dimension of R, is the maximum possible length of a chain. A chain of what? Um, prime ideals, okay. So. distinct prime ideals. The dimension of R is said to be infinite if R has an arbitrarily, has arbitrarily long chains of distinct prime ideals. Okay, so this is the notion of, of Kroll dimension. So he says here, well, okay, so what, what is a, um, what's an Artinian ring, by the way? What does it satisfy? Descending, descending chain condition on ideals. What's that say? What's the descending chain condition on ideals say? By the way, this is named after Emil Artin, um, who was, along with no other, you know, instrumental in really refining ring theory in the early 20th century. Right. These, these two, I think, are the ones who really took Galois theory and really recast it in a more abstract light. All right. So that's, that would be an Artinian ring that satisfies the descending chain condition. Um, what, would, what would satisfy the, uh, the ascending chain condition? Yeah, no Therian rings, exactly. So no, no Therian ring. The ascending chain condition, um, which is to say that um, if you have a nested chain of ideals, right, where the one is a subset of the next is a subset of, I mean, it's getting larger and larger and larger, then at some point, what happens? Is the whole ring, or it's just, it, it's not the whole ring, it doesn't feel whole ring, right? It, but it has to do what? Yeah, it has to stabilize, right? Yeah. Um, so at some point, it's constant. Okay, so those those the difference between Artinian and Noetherian. Um, and he says a ring with finite dimension must satisfy both the ascending and descending chain conditions on prime ideals. A field has dimension zero. A principal ideal that's not a field has dimension one. That's kind of neat. Kroll dimension, uh, would I just say zero for a field? 
one for PID, which is not a field. <laughs> Does that make sense that the, it would be zero for a field? Because there's just one prime ideal. <laughs> okay, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, the number starts at zero. Something, something that I would have thought you would have anticipated. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're having some ultimate nerd battle about whether or not the natural number started at zero or one before class today. So, I was not involved. For the record, I don't care. <laughs> Which is just not to say I'm not a nerd. It's just to say not about that. All right, um, I really just don't care. I'm sorry, I, I just, I can't care. Um, I care that I have sometimes given lectures with the natural number starting at zero, and I've sometimes given lectures with the natural number starting at one. And when I look back at the set of lectures that I've given and I'm asked a question about one, I have no earthly idea which convention I was using. I care about that. I don't like that. I regret using zero as a natural number that one semester. Ah, anyway. Ah, no, not yet. I don't know enough to regret it. Okay. It's here. Um, so I'm, I'm shielded by my ignorance. But uh, uh, what, else does we, what else do we learn here? Um, if R is an integral domain that's also finitely generated, uh, it's, that's also a finitely generated K algebra over a field K, then the dimension of R is equal to the transcendence degree over K of the field of fractions of R. In particular, the crawl dimension agrees with the definition introduced earlier for the definition the dimension of an affine variety. The advantage of the definition above is not refer to any k-algebra structure and applies to an arbitrary commutative ring. So I, w I think what he's saying, if I can cut through that, I believe that would mean that the crawl dimension... Yeah, maybe if we're... so. That's what it says. He says the, the dimension of R is equal to the, he says the crawl, I don't have a symbol for it yet, the crawl dimension of R is equal to the transcendence degree, transcendence degree of the transcendence degree over K of the field of fractions of R. And all of this is predicated on the assumption that uh, um, it, R is an integral domain that's also finitely generated as a k-algebra. Finitely generated. It's a lot of it's a lot of bells and whistles there, eh? Um, I'm trying to think if that actually fits the. Um, for example, I don't think hyper number, hyperbolic numbers qualify here. Hyperbolic numbers are not an integral domain. You know. So, my usual I mean my usual notion of dimension of an algebra is as follows. So for me, an algebra, what I'm thinking about an algebra, is a n-dimensional vector space, and I keep it real, with a multiplication, right, which is usually associative. I like to have unital multiplications, associative, unital, and uh, basically satisfies a bilinearity condition. And so that's my notion of algebra, usually, which is limited. I mean, for example, this wouldn't allow, Lie algebras are algebras which don't satisfy the associative condition. But 
um, there's also a universal enveloping thing that we do for Lie algebras, which puts it in the context of a larger associative algebra. So, I mean, like, Lie algebras don't really exist in a vacuum away from associative algebras either. Even the general theoretical discussions involve. No, it is not finite dimensional. No, no, no. Lie, there's like lots of known for infinite. Infinite dimensional Lie algebras, there's a fair amount known. There, in fact, are um, a few. I mean, you can study their structure. It turns out there's a few infinite families of them. You can classify these things by um, so called Dinkin diagrams or Young tableaus. I forget which is physics and which is math. They seem to me to be the same thing. Ah. Yeah, all of these things are, are basically ways of figuring out what the irreducible components are when you tensor things together. For example, you have a homework problem where I asked you to show that any uh, two zero tensor is the is the sum of a of a um, a symmetric and anti-symmetric tensor, right? That's just the tensor analog of the thing we learn in linear, namely that Rn by n, or you take F, it gets Fn by n. And this notation is, of course, offensive to you now, but it was kind of reasonable in linear. Um, so the um, symmetric, yeah, it was bad. It's bad notation. It's really bad, but you don't know about the symmetric and the alternating group when you take linear, so it's relatively unharm unharmful. I mean, what am I, 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 I don't know. I, I have yet to find a good notational I should probably do something like, you know, Sn, An for linear versus this for permutations, right? But anyway, I haven't. Uh, by the time I realize what's happened, it's too late, you know. Um, so I need to, that's that's like long-term strategic planning on notation for me. How do I fix this? <laughs> but the larger point here was just that these are. In some sense, like, these are irreducible components of that. I can break this into two pieces, which have no overlap. You know, every matrix decomposes into a sum of a symmetric and an anti-symmetric matrix, uniquely so. Every type zero tensor, zero two tensor, decomposes into a symmetric and an anti-symmetric tensor, uniquely so. So, about a type three tensor, can you decompose the type zero three tensor as a as a sum of a symmetric and anti-symmetric? You know, uh, no, no, you can't. You can just do the counting. The, you know, the number of completely symmetric versus the number of completely anti-symmetric type zero three tensors does not add up to the number of all possible type zero three tensors. So there's other things out there, and that's what those young tableaus get at, or the what did you call it? Dinkin diagrams. These these kind of things have to. Related to what? What groups? Uh, Can you spell it? Uh, C -O -X -C -O -X. Oh, 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 okay, yeah, yes, yes, yes. These, these groups. Yeah, and those are related to the possible rotations of polygons, uh, yeah. polytopes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway. The, the larger point is that when you start looking at how you decompose higher tensors, it leads you to questions. You know, how do you actually rip it apart into its, its fundamental pieces? And these things become important when you're doing things like taking a three and putting it together with a three bar, excuse me, tensoring it with a three bar, and then tensoring it with another, you know, uh, three or whatever, you know, whatever that means. These are, you know, representations of SU3. These are quark representations, and the tensor product would be something like, in physics, when we take, we when we have particles interact, we take the tensor product of their representations, and then, what's possible over here is various direct sums of stuff. What stuff is possible over there is what representation theory tells you, how to, like, decompose the tensor product of a few things into a direct sum of other things. Each one of the things that appears in the direct sum would correspond to a different physical outcome of that set, that kind of interaction. That's why group theory is interesting to to physics physics people. Well, that's one of many reasons, of course. But anyway, 
Okay, so curl dimension, interesting. I don't believe it quite matches my usual notion of vector space dimension for the algebras that I'm interested in personally, but whatever. Nevertheless, curl dimension I think is important. So it's worth mentioning. Um, <clears throat> See, the uh, rational canonical form is behind us, so let me erase it. Although it's in front of you, because it will definitely be on that take-home test. Let's see here. So definition, the Jacobson radical. What's the Jacobson radical? Is the intersection intersection of all maximal ideals of R. And is denoted <clears throat> Jack, Mar, there we go. Um, we are told here that the Jacobson radical is analogous to the Frattini subgroup of a group, um, and it enjoys some corresponding properties. So here's some, some fun properties of the Jacobson radical. This is Proposition 1 on page 751, um, thumb and foot. So let curse of J be the Jacobson radical of some um, commutative ring. Uh, point number one, if I is proper ideal, of R, then so is um, I comma J. All right. Name, and what is that notation here? This, this notation I comma J, does that make sense to you? What is that? Right. It's the greatest common divisor of the ideals I and J. But it's also the ideal generated by I and J. Think about how this works, right? So if you have the ideal 2 and you have the ideal 3 in the integers, what do you get? You get the greatest common divisor of 2 and 3, well, the ideal of that, otherwise known as z. Yeah. Right, there's that, uh, exactly, so let's see here, so what, 3 divides 6, so how's it go? Um, 6z is a subset of 3z, yeah. So this is the interplay between divisibility and uh, containment. Divisibility for numbers gets interchanged for containment in ideals in the opposite order. Do you have something against the Jacobson radical? I noticed you left exactly when we started talking about the Jacobson radical. I would not say that. Okay. It's coincidental? Yes. Okay, 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 okay. Jacobson, of course, is also another important name to know about early 20th century mathematics. Um, Jacobson did a lot, <laughs> a lot of stuff. Um, and uh, I've heard people say before, it's kind of annoying when Jacobson did something because he kind of like, other mathematicians will do a little bit and then they'll leave other stuff for other people to do, like some breadcrumbs for us mere mortals to like work on. Jacobson just kind of did everything that he kind of touched on. Um, you know, you've seen that. You know that homework exercise you do in abstract where you get, um, how's it go? 
like a squared is equal to a, and that forces the ring to be Boolean. Is that right? Yeah, for, so it forces, yeah, I think if you have a squared equals to a for everything in a ring, it forces a b to equal to b a, and it basically forces it to be a Boolean ring. This is a, a common uh, homework okay. problem. It, it, it is also such that two, two times any ring element is zero, so it's, it's in that sense Boolean. So Jacobson did that, yeah, um, but then of course not being content with that, solved the um, you know a to the n equal to a problem for like any n if I if I recall correctly. So there there is you know I, that's, I don't know, but anyway, Jacobson has written you know uh, important. Uh, abstract algebra textbooks, like you can get in Dover, Jacobson's Abstract Algebra 1 and 2. It continues to be a resource. It was written in the 80s. It's, you know, not unlike this. Probably worth reading. Deeper than this in a certain sense. Um, anyway, so Jacob, Jacobson was, was, a, was a deep and important mathematician last century. So there's the one thing. Um, they, too, more what I'm interested in. The Jacobson radical contains the nil radical. So let's see here. So rad zero subset of Jacobson radical. Three x is an element of the Jacobson radical, if and only if. It's kind of neat. I, oh, not I, rather one minus r x is unit for all r and r four, and this is Nakayama's lemma. If M is any finitely generated R module, if R is any, rather, if M is any finitely generated R module, and the Jacobson radical of M equals to M. Huh. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's Jacobson, yeah, you're right. Jacobson radical times m equals to m. Then m equals to what? Zero, yes. We have a winner. <clears throat> All right, so um, so there's also about a page of you know talking about discuss properties of Artinian rings, um, and they're uh, one of the things we learn about an Artinian. What's an Artinian ring again? Yeah, satisfies the, and what did that tell us about modules built over an Artinian ring? Is that the necessary finite condition? I mean, is, a, is, it, is the module going to be finitely generated if it's built over an Artinian ring? Do we get to say something like that? I'm trying to remember. Ah, right. So we had a theorem about submodules being finitely generated. That, that, that sounds right. There were a lot of, there were a bunch of results about finitely generated and the interplay between no theory and, you know, base rings and so forth. But um, 
Anyway, here's the one I wanted to state. Theorem 3, part 2. So here we assume um, R is Artinian. Um, and so it says that the quotient R mod the Jacobson radical of R is isomorphic to K1 cross K2 cross Kn. In particular, he says that the quotient is the direct product of a finite number of fields. All right. And um, those fields are formed. So the, basically, the deal is that the Jacobson radical, right, is equal to what is it's the intersection of um, the maximal ideals, right? So if those maximal ideals are m1 through mn, then these. Uh, let's see here. So R mod M1 is these, 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 like that. Yeah. All right. Furthermore, yes, the Chinese remainder theorem is what does it. It's on page 753. Good call. All right. So that, that's, he's that section describing a little bit about the basic properties of Artinian rings and so forth. Then I'm going to skip over here. So he's got about 70 pages on basic algebraic geometry, which is kind of neat. And that brings us to theorem four in section 18.2, which is basically where I'm going to end this course in my, in my speaking this semester. This is Wedderburn's theorem. Wedderburn's. So the uh, definition I just erased annoyingly. You know, people s were studying these around the turn of the 20th century, and it wasn't at all clear what the possible associative algebras were out there in some sense. I mean, like, if you add, I mean, it's still not entirely clear to me what are all possible associative algebras. I think that's a hard question. But um, if you add some conditions, then it becomes a little bit easier. So this is Wedderburn's theorem. It says the following are equivalent. Um, so, and this is for non-zero R with one. And here R is not, it doesn't have to be commutative. Right? R could be non-commutative. So here are the one, and some of these things won't make sense to us because we haven't studied them. Every R module is projective to, I say we haven't studied them, some of you may have studied them. Every R module is injective. Three, every R module is, yeah, by no is re completely reducible. So what completely, completely reducible means is that you can reduce it completely. Let's see here. Um, for, it's actually not far from that, but um, every ring considered as a left R module, every ring are considered as left R module is direct sum R is equal to L1 direct sum L2 direct sum to that direct sum LN where each Li is a simple module. Uh, 
I, I, which means here in this context just means a simple left ideal with um, L sub i equal to R times E sub i for some E sub i in R with, well, there's lots to part, part four here's got a lot of, it's got a lot of strings attached here. Part one, um, E i, E j, zero, for i not equal to j, um, two, these are idempotents. E i squared is equal to E i, right, for all i. And, ooh, one other thing. The sum, i equals 1 to n, of E i is equal to 1. And then 5, as in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, this is the end of 4. As rings, R is isomorphic to the direct product of matrix rings over division rings. So he says the R, you know, equals R1, R2, Rn, oh, rather R sub R. And um, each one of these, each one of these R sub J is isomorphic to how to write this. Um, I could say matrices, um, square matrices, their size, well, my usual notation would be probably something like uh, delta sub j comma n sub j. So they're matrices with entries taken from a division ring delta j, nj by nj sized. And he says that the, um, the integer r, the integers n sub j, and the division rings delta j up to isomorphism are uniquely determined by R. This is Wedderburn's theorem. By the way, definition, if R satisfies any of 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, then we say R is semi-simple. With minimum condition. Usually in math, semi-simple tends to mean that while the thing is not simple, it can be written as a direct sum of simple things. It's completely reducible into simple components. All right, so like matrix, matrix rings are simple, for example. Um, so this is a, you know, a direct, this is a decomposition of the ring into a direct, direct product of simple things. That's why calling this semi-simple makes a lot of sense to me. Right. You can also take time to enjoy the fact that we've just given an incredibly technical definition to semi-simple. But <laughs> sorry. Um, so anyway, larger point here, guys, is that if so, if R is commutative, right? 
So if, if R is commutative and, you know, the real numbers are a subset um, of the center of the ring, right? Suppose that there's a copy of the reals that commutes with your ring. What are the possible, what are the possible division rings over the reals? Do you know? Right. Yeah, so your choices are delta equal to the reals itself, right? That's a division algebra. Complexes. Quaternions. That's it. The octonians do not form a division algebra because they're not associative. Quaternions are associative, but just barely so. Now, proving that those are the only division rings, you can also find in Curtis linear algebra. It's like his final section. It's about three pages of gory linear algebra. It's pretty neat. So if you think about this, if R is commutative, what does that say? A semi-simple semi algebra, right? Oh, man, I'm sorry. But anyway, getting to the point, a semi-simple algebra a semi-simple algebra over R is a direct product of matrix rings. A commutative semi-simple algebra then can't have any of these because it's non-commutative. So a commutative semi-simple algebra is the direct product of copies of the real numbers and the complex numbers. And that's it. And that's why I've been able to prove some pretty interesting theorems in the last couple of years about commutative semi-simple algebras. For example, I've proved the equivalence of uh, differentiability built from a difference quotient and differentiability built from a Frechet quotient with a um, you know, usual algebraic condition. So that, that, I mean, it's very forgiving. Like commutative semi-simple algebra is basically a direct product of fields. So you can do things like build a logarithm on it. Nathan, Nathaniel, uh, Nathan Bedell did that and some other things like that. So, and I've been working a lot in commutative semi-simple algebras, so I know a fair amount about them. And uh, anyway, I think that's a decent place to end the course. So, well, actually, the course is just beginning next time you guys. So I will not tape those because it's just unfriendly to tape student talks. <laughs>